Dr. Stephen Anna for giving me the privilege of uh, preaching God's word. It is an honor always to take the word of God and uh, bring the word to light under the ministry of the Holy Spirit. There are very few times when the preacher is not sure if he is in the body or not. And uh, this is one of those times, so bear with me in case you see some glaring mistakes. But worse even is if the congregation is not sure if they're in the body or not while they're listening. So I pray that you would please pay attention, particularly as we make almost a big leap in our preaching series from the New Testament, where we are in the book of Hebrews. We're taking a big leap as we go back into the Old Testament story of God's redeeming work. You know, the story of God's dealings with the people of Israel in the Old Testament can be summarized essentially into five words. And I want you to please hold your thought with me as I track you down these five words number one you can understand God's dealings in the word election essentially in Genesis 12 God begins his work of redeeming by choosing a nation called Israel by picking up a man called Abraham and then we move to the second word this is God's sovereign gracious election of choosing a man and promising that ultimately the savior of the world the lord jesus christ is going to come through him or rather through this nation so that salvation can be availed for all men and the second word is exodus it is after 400 years of uh, Israelites slavery in the land of Egypt God brought these redeemed community as they walked out with joy out of the doorposts that were covered with the blood of the lamb a foreshadowing of the work of the Lord Jesus Christ in the future and then the third word is establishment so they're all E so that we will remember election Exodus and the third word is establishment as they came out of Egypt at Mount Sinai God made a covenant with them almost like a marriage vow where they were asked to say I will or we will as God's people abide by God's word so God gave them the law at Mount Sinai and now God brought them under the leadership of Moses and Joshua as they took the land of Canaan under Joshua's leadership and they began to dwell there and they lived there for close to 700 years as they went through something in thin and thick through some very highs and lows of their dwelling in the promised land and the next word that captures the essence of God's dealings with his people is the word exile exile is where they were sent out of this promised land which God said where he himself would dwell in the midst of his people the most prominent place on planet earth in the Old Testament is Israel and the most prominent place in Israel is the temple because where the highest of heavens can't contain the God who said that he would dwell with his people there but God also made many promises and gave them several warnings in the first five books particularly Leviticus numbers in Deuteronomy that if these people who were redeemed by God if they do not live by God's word God said he would discipline them judgment was going to come through their 700 years of stay there people began people and princes alike began to turn away from God's word after David the kingdom went to Solomon and after Solomon the kingdom of Israel United Kingdom of Israel was divided into two ten tribes in the north were called Israel and two tribes in the south were called Judah and we do not see any ray of any hope of good king in Israel while in Judah there were some some times of uh, you know good kings that came to bring about reformation but what I want you to remember is this that before they went into exile which was prophesied that they would be there in the exile for 70 years all the prophets major and minor all the prophets finished their prophetic ministry revelation was received before everybody went into exile then came Assyrian kingdom which took over the northern part which is the ten tribes you don't need to keep everything in mind I'm just giving you the picture because Nehemiah has to do a, deal a lot with history so the ten tribes of uh, Israel up there in the north was first taken over by Assyrians and the way Assyrians take over a kingdom is basically they take a people group and assimilate them or rather they mix them they scatter them across and they were scattered across the then known world and then after 136 years of God's gracious, merciful, prophetic warnings by, by prophet after prophet, 
Judah did not learn its lesson from its brothers and God ultimately brought Babylon where now the Assyrian kingdom was taken over by Babylonians. So Babylon's king Nebuchadnezzar comes and by the sovereign hand of God upon him, he destroys the temple and basically people are taken into captive, which is what is recorded at the last part of the Old Testament according to their chronology in 2 Chronicles chapter 36. Now for 70 years they were in exile. There were only two prophets plus Lamentations, which is Jeremiah's writings. Those were the only three books that were written during the time of exile, Daniel and Ezekiel, which is where most of the prophecy in a way about the coming Messiah was also given. Now, after this 70 years, you see the famous prayer of Daniel saying, God, remember your covenant, your promise. And now is the time for you to restore your work of taking your people back to the promised land. During this time, Ezra chapter 1 to 6 reminds us of how the first batch of first batch of people from the exile returned to the promised land under the able leadership of Zerubbabel and Joshua. They come back, which is chronicled in Ezra chapter 1 to 6. They come back and they begin to build the temple. But after which 58 years of gap has come, which is not recorded exactly in the book of Ezra, but we know as you look at the time, during which time Esther, by God's providence, was placed on the throne so that God's kingdoms can advance and God's purposes through his people can advance. During this time, while Esther was still on the throne in some way or the other, Ezra makes his second return or rather the second batch of people move from you know, Babylon back to the promised land to continue to propagate God's work. And when they go back, they begin to build the city of Jerusalem. However, Ezra chapter 4 tells us that suddenly they were stopped by the enemies there, the Arabs there, the enemies there, and therefore they could not continue their work. 13 years have gone by during which time God places another man exactly in this time of history to bring and continue his work of redeeming and sanctifying his people. This is where we come to the book of Nehemiah. Nehemiah is the last part of Old Testament history. The only contemporaneous person with Nehemiah was one more prophet named Malachi, which in the English Bible is, you know, is placed at the end. After Nehemiah is finally the final fifth word is expectation. They were expecting the ultimate Messiah, the anointed one to come and ultimately deliver them from all other dominion and power that was put on them. So election, exodus, establishment, exile and expectation. They were expecting the Messiah to come. However, they were not sure as to how God would continue his work. Now, all that we are going to see, there are 13 chapters in the book of Nehemiah. And by the way, these are, in a way, the personal memoirs of a reformer. But God, in his grace, actually inspired him so that this can be part of his divine scripture, the canon. All that we see in the book of Nehemiah is basically begins in chapter 1. And therefore this morning as we examine chapter 1, I'm going to divide the book, the chapter into two parts which I'll quickly explain in a while. But I want you to look at two things carefully, not just listen to what I'm preaching, two things carefully. Number one, the absent character in the book, in the chapter, Nehemiah, chapter 1, which is God and how he works in the hearts of people to continue his work. And the second thing is the very the eminent character that you see Nehemiah and how he responds as he says in his own words the hand of God that was upon him these two things I want you to get so that you get the essence of what and how God works in these 13 chapters the first seven chapters and the last six chapters can be divided into these two parts in the first seven chapters dear brothers and sisters you see the work of the reconstruction of the wall that is what Nehemiah is burdened about and he goes into Israel to do but then from eighth chapter he realizes that it has more to do with not just with building on the walls it is to do with the restoration of God's people so first is reconstruction second is the restoration of God's people the key word in the first seven chapters is wall it comes up so many times and you turn the word around almost it forms the second key word the law they realize that it is because they have broken the law of God 
that their defense system has come down. So the key word in the second part is law. The first part, seven chapters deal with physical security. But as Nehemiah carefully investigates and join hands with the other reformer Ezra and almost takes back seed in, in, in a way to signify the essence or the prominence of God's word because Ezra was a reformer also as a priest, a scribe who brought back preaching or reading of God's word back to Israel, we see that second half of the book deals with spiritual security. And finally, the first seven chapters in a way deal with how God's people ought to work and the last six chapters speak about how, as they work, God's people begin to worship God through all that they are and through all that they do. So quickly, it is not just the reconstruction of the wall, but the restoration of God's people. It is not just about the physical walls that have been broken down, but it is the law of God that they have broken and the consequences that they are now reaping. It is not just the physical security that they needed that was very apparent, but what was hidden is the spiritual security that they lost because they moved out of God-laid boundaries. And it is not just about who they were and what they did, but who they belonged to that, I did, that distinguishes world work and worship. Are you with me so far? Yes. All right. Since the scripture has already been read, I'm going to quickly pray and then we will look at the two parts that are before us in verses 1 to 11. Father, we come before you in the name of your son by whose blood, O oh Lord, you have given us access. There is nothing else that makes us come before you. The holy angels dread to come into your presence because you are holy, holy, holy. But we who are sinful, who were once your enemies, can now come into your presence because you made this accessible. In the name of your son we come and we pray that you would please, please kindle a holy fire on the altar of our hearts that will set us ablaze for the glory of God. Wake us up, O Lord, and those who have settled down into comforts and complacency, we pray that your word will be the fire in our bones. Holy Spirit, God, we pray for your ministry amidst of us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The real hero in the entire book of Nehemiah is God. It is the unseen hand of God that moves all the visible characters both within the Israelite community and with outside of Israelite community to accomplish his purposes. As the scripture says, who can thwart the purposes of God? We will see time and again that this truth is replete in the pages of the Holy Bible. The first three verses here are very evident. As Nehemiah begins his memoirs, his book, he doesn't even tell us completely about who he is and what he's been doing. Almost like he wants the readers to feel that that is unimportant to the cause that was before him. And then the second four, uh, from four to eleven, speaks about Nehemiah's heart before God. So one, two, three, I put it down as Nehemiah's inquiry. Nehemiah's inquiry and 4 to 11 Nehemiah's entreaty. You can call it Nehemiah's comforts and Nehemiah's concerns, whichever way you'd like to do. Nehemiah's inquiry. The words of Nehemiah, son of Hakaliah. In the month of Kislev, in the 20th year, while I was in the citadel of Susa, Hanani, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other men, and I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile, and also about Jerusalem. They said to me, those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down, and its gates have been burnt with fire. I want to break down these three verses into three things to help us understand three things that are evident. Number one, though it is not very explicit, but we can read between the lines and pick up clues from Nehemiah chapter 1 to find the comforts of Nehemiah. The kind of life Nehemiah was living. A life that anybody in any age would actually envy. He was living a very comfortable life. And you must understand, he was an alien, a foreigner, almost a slave in a foreign land 
where the king was the emperor of almost of all the then known world. But Nehemiah lived a very comfortable life. He had a very privileged occupation, job, as we would call profession. And what was his profession? The last verse, as we read, says that he was a cupbearer to the king. Now, this was certainly not like one of the ministerial ranks that Joseph or Daniel held. But this, he's almost like a palace slave, but a very privileged position because this was given by the king to somebody whose not competence alone, but character can be trusted. And Nehemiah had to basically, like in the you know, ancient Near East, everywhere almost in the ancient East, basically kings had close confidants who, confidants who would take care of several aspects of king's administrative work. And Nehemiah's job primarily was to eat or drink, or rather basically he was the security system through which king's basic meals went through. Which means, if anybody was basically envying the throne, they could have easily bribed Nehemiah and basically taken over the kingdom by paying him a very, very large sum. So for the king to trust a man, the king's you know, uh, uh, resume has not just a man with competence, but with character. Brothers, I want to make a quick application. I want us to think through. Do your people at your workplace, your employer, can he trust you only for your competence or can he also trust you for your character? See, competence is what you are paid for. Character is what you're trusted for. A goon can do a great job. A person whose heart is wicked can do a great job. But ultimately, remember, relationships are built not merely on our competence. While it takes a great place in the professional world, it is the character that ultimately wins the hearts of people. And I want to tell you that how this actually plays when we get to chapter 2, how this actually goes hand in glove with how God was going to work through the king. And Nehemiah was a man who had a comfortable life, but that came at a cost of his character. He lived a comfortable life. He had a privileged position and he certainly enjoyed a certain degree of power that a normal Jew at his time wouldn't have enjoyed. He was the one who was closely in many ways associated with the king and that would have availed him a great deal of power. But what I want to draw your attention to is this, that this was happening basically in the month of Kisle, which was probably November or December. That is why we know that he was in the citadel of Susa. And Nehemiah was one man who was given access to this place primarily because the kings basically used this as their winter palace. At a, pro- at a time where probably the, the, maybe they, they, they were on a low key in terms of administrative work or maybe in terms of taking care of their enemies, that the work was low. This was a time where the kings probably took their winter vacation there and Nehemiah had this access. And Warren Viersby and other commentators tell us that actually this is one of the majestic palaces out there in the world at that time. And Nehemiah had access to this place. What am, I, what am I trying to picture before you? This is a kind of lucrative, envious corporate position any of us would have wanted to have at any cost sometimes. What I want to bring your attention to is this. He was placed in a favorable position with a considerable amount of power and had comfortable lifestyle. But he was a man, I want you to pay attention, he was a man who knew their place in his life. He was a man who did not allow them on these privileges and comforts to decide or direct the steps of his life. He knew that God in his sovereign providence has placed him. And how do I know? How can I make such a bold statement? As we go further, we will see. As his concerns reveal his heart, we will see that Nehemiah was a man who did not let his professional glory get the better of him. He was a man who was placed there by sovereign providence of God, but he knew that he was there to advance the eternal purposes of God and not to get himself indulged in the temporal pleasures of the world. Nehemiah had a comfortable life. But look at verse 2. 
while he were, had a, a, a privileged position, a position that we would want to envy, while he had the comforts of his, his time, he lived a very comfortable lifestyle. Verse 2 tells us something very unique about Nehemiah. The one Hanani, one of my brothers, by the way, this Hanani could be his real brother or could have been at least his close relative because chapter 7 verse 2 gives us another clue that he was his brother, one of his brothers. So basically, he must have known this person Hanani. When this man along with other brothers came with certain men from Judah, basically they went and they returned back to Babylon or Susa where Nehemiah was. And I asked them concerning the Jews who escaped and who had survived the exile and concerning Jerusalem. Nehemiah's concern revealed a great deal about what he valued, what his priorities were. He said, two things were his concerns. Can you read and tell me? Can you identify those two things? They're very apparent. You can put it in your own words. What was Nehemiah's question, inquiry all about? Two things about the people of God and about the place of God that he said he would dwell. Man, think about this man. They were under the shame of enemies invasion for the last 70 years. He was a man who grew up as a slave. By God's gracious providence, he climbed the corporate ladder and basically he's at a very comfortable place in life. And probably we don't know how many years is God commented to say he was probably a young man. So he could have pursued his natural desires to live a safe life, to live a godly life, to live a holy life. But Nehemiah's concerns reveal otherwise. His concerns were primarily about two things. God's people and God's presence. God's people and God's presence. You see, the promises of God, which were given to the children of Israel, did not take their full realization because kings, priests, prophets alike have failed in many, many ways. Although God had a remnant in Israel. And when they failed, God ultimately sent them into captivity. And now after 70 years, God in his grace is doing his work as people are making a move back to the promised land. He could have simply thought, let me now settle down and see whatever I can do from here. But Nehemiah's heart is basically elsewhere. It is one thing, my brothers, to be placed in a comfortable position in life. It is altogether another thing to not get those comforts and tangle your heart and take away your heart. That takes a heart of a man who's basically sold out to God. It is one thing, dear brothers and sisters, when all of us go through difficult times saying, Lord, if you bring me out of this, I will serve you. And I doubt we will, if we will ever do that. The concerns of a man who is privileged, placed in a position of authority and security speaks highly about his value system and his priorities. And likewise, our concerns today, brothers and sisters, reveal a great deal about both the desires of our heart and in many ways the disposition of our heart. What are you concerned about? When you get to meet God's people, what are your general questions like? I do not mean to say that you have to have some sort of a spiritual syndrome that you put on yourself where you suddenly meet people and you suddenly ask you know, erratic spiritual inquiries. That's not what I mean to say. But deep down in your heart, what is it that you're concerned about, particularly in terms of God's people? I want to say this. You take a survey of all God's people, Old and New Testament and church history till today, men and women alike. Two things have always consumed godly people, the glory of God and the good of his people. The most precious position, dear brothers and sisters, that we have besides God is God's people. The most precious position. And Nehemiah's heart reveals a great deal about where his priorities were and what his value system was all about. Third thing that we see in his inquiry, not only did we get to know his comfortable lifestyle, but his concerns. Verse 3, we get a response from these travelers who came back from Judah. Verse 3, and they said to me, the remnant there in the province who had survived the exile uh, is in great trouble and shame. 
the wall of jerusalem is broken down and its gates are destroyed by fire what was the condition of people here is a quick report about the people now obviously because these are the this is a personal journal of nehemiah probably they would have expanded and given him a graphic picture of what the condition was but these are the words that nehemiah put down so in nehemiah's uh, uh, visualization of what they said he is able to basically see that the condition of god's people uh, is in great trouble and shame and the reason is apparent because the wall of jerusalem is broken down and its gates are destroyed by fire look at those two words two words uh, the remnant there in the province who had survived the exile survived the exile and the next couplet is great trouble and shame surviving the exile is one word basically that captures the 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 sinful nature of god's people though they were redeemed by god and the holy disciplinary act that god brings about into his people's life irrespective of who they are they survived the exile and what is their condition they were in great trouble and shame why great trouble obviously their physical security defense system is totally destroyed walls were brought down why were they in great shame for two reasons they speak about a god who is the god of heaven they speak about an exodus where they have once upon a time dethroned the mightiest power that was there on planet earth egypt and they occupied this promised land that was possessed by seven powerful nations now where is the god where is your god that is how the enemies viewed israel and they lived with this shame day in and day out you know and nehemiah hears these words right and why were the walls of jerusalem broken by the way there are two views to this broken walls i personally do not uh, subscribe to the first view i believe it is the second view the first view is that these were the walls that were broken down 100 years ago when nebuchadnezzar came to invade jerusalem right but i believe these walls probably were in some way reconstructed because ezra gives us a picture of the reconstruction work that began to take place however there was a correspondence that happened between the enemies of israel while ezra was reconstructing the uh, reconstructing uh, jerusalem and the king writes back saying let them stop the work probably it is during this time the work was not only halted probably the work was also in a way destroyed because nehemiah was well aware of the walls that were broken down 100 years ago it is no new news in fact hanni and the brothers and everybody knew their fathers told them but these were freshly broken down walls although god's promise is now going to be realized in the sense that people are going back and god would once again reestablish his nation of israel in the promised land they still faced persecution they still faced opposition and the walls that were broken down have great significance you see we may not understand the walls of a country and their significance in our present time because they don't mean anything to us because we right now don't live in kingdoms we live in presidential and in many ways uh, then we're all monarchies you know in, in some way or the other but th- these were people who depended on what what is the significance of a wall to a nation number one the, here are, here are three things i want to give you number one they stand primarily for protection wall of a nation signified the strength of the defense system or the military power or the intelligentsia of that particular nation and that is why when the children of israel had to go and make their battle against one of the seven nations what was their one of their first fears when they went to jericho the walls were high their walls were very very high and they cannot bring them down if you can't hit break the wall you can never get to the enemy and their walls were meant for protection number 2 their walls were meant also to separate the insiders from outsiders so separation protection number 2 is separation it was meant to recognize the insider from the outsider from 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 the citizen from uh, uh, to, to to recognize a foreigner third thing the walls for god's people 
also showed the boundaries of their freedom god specifically told them not to have anything to do with the pagan nations in fact when in in Deuteronomy chapter 8 if i'm not wrong god said that you are meant to be a community of light i'm paraphrasing it so that people will actually see and say what kind of people are these that their laws are so righteous and their god is so intimate with them they are meant to show them their limitation and not to cross the boundary of god given freedom protection separation and limitation and think about this and and if you're thinking well you would have already made the connection aren't these all the attributes of god's word of the law of god that when god brought them out of egypt not a single command was given to them they came out from the under the blood of the lamb but once they were redeemed they were given the law at mount sinai saying now that you are redeemed you come to live under my lordship and that is why the first commandment is i am the lord your god who brought you out of egypt therefore you shall have no other gods i bought you by the blood of the lamb in a way prefiguring the work of the lord jesus christ now that you are mine here is my covenant here are the set of holy laws by which you will live your life they are meant for protection separation and also to show their limitation nehemiah's inquiry brought this result that the broken walls of jerusalem are in some way a miniature reflection of the spiritual condition of god's people of what has happened over the years and then when nehemiah heard these words we now enter the lengthiest part of this first chapter verses 4 to 11 nehemiah's entreaty nehemiah's prayer When I heard these things I sat down and wept for some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven by the way I just wanted to make 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 a mention of this why was Nehemiah concerned and I said that throughout history God's people were always concerned those who were godly and on fire for God were always concerned about two things God's glory and God's people you know this is not a new thing He was David was just asked to play the delivery man when he was asked to take bread and butter to his brothers who was in the battlefield but what does David do he goes and makes an inquiry and that turns out to be that he has a face off with Goliath Joseph's business and by the way Joseph who on earth will trust a prisoner with the keys of the prison a jailer trusted him because of his character and what does Joseph do he, he goes around asking people and once he actually asks two people who were sad and then you know what has happened afterwards this is not a new thing this is what god's people are truly concerned about and by the way dear brothers and sisters i want to i want to show you from the scripture that this can't be a fabricated thing this has to be this comes only when god shapes your heart whatever happens by yourself after a while will fizz out but if god brings the genuine burden the process we will see but if god brings that it will evolve into participating in the in god's vision for your life and god's vision for god's people but if it comes anything outside of it it will fade out when i heard these things now we move on quickly to the nehemiah's prayer when i heard these things i sat down and wept for some days i mourned and fasted and prayed before the god of heaven then i said lord the god of heaven the great and awesome god who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keep his commandments let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer your servant is praying before you day and night for your servants the people of israel i confess the sins we israelites including myself and my father's family have committed against you what was nehemiah's immediate response to this heartbreaking news this news that basically caught him uh, you know unawares what was nehemiah's response prayer prayer see our immediate response to calamities and some things that catches of god actually speaks volumes about who we are and how we view god where we go to when calamity hits us immediately immediately when calamity hits us speaks a lot about our spiritual caliber his immediate involuntary reflex to this news was prayer I want to make a statement please listen to this and see if it has any truth our reflexes 
are an indication to the habits we have cultivated as a lifetime discipline our reflexes to things that suddenly hit us are basically an indication to the habits we have cultivated as a life time discipline that tells me that nehemiah must have been a man who have learned to pray even before this news came he was a man probably whose life was built on prayer and i want to say this a man whose life or a woman whose life is built on prayer is basically built on prayer because they know god through the word that is a genuine indication that a person has true knowledge of god not just knowledge about god but knowing the person of god through the word of god you see it is impossible to fake in public okay especially when you are caught off guard by some news like that what you are not in private it's not possible to fake such a response now i am not under the impression that nehemiah sat down right there and did but certainly as nehemiah is putting these things down in his journal much after they would have happened that this was nehemiah's response in the heart and we know that this was not just a immediate you know some sort of youthful excitement that he had towards the news that he heard because it went on for at least 4 months how do i know that's the calculation between the month that is mentioned in chapter 1 and the month that is mentioned in chapter 2 was one before he actually went to the king to request for this huge favor four months and he himself says when i heard these things my response was i sat down and wept for some days i moaned and fasted and prayed before the god of heaven he must have had an experience of sitting in the presence of the lord in prayer in his private life day in and day out and therefore when such news hit him his natural response was to go to god and dear brothers and sisters i want to say this if there's one big application i want to give from the entire sermon it is this it is this please listen carefully god shapes our heart for his purposes when we go to god and give god our heart daily in prayer that may look like a very very simple statement but that has been the evidence of all god's people in god's history and experience also tells us the same god shapes our heart with a burden that god wants us to have when we daily give god our heart in prayer not just praying but begin to give our god uh, our heart to god in prayer There are four things just like there are four pillars on which a foundation has to be laid Nehemiah's prayer had four things and everything comes from uh, the other thing that is mentioned before look at the four things as i bring the sermon to a close number 1 he recognizes the covenant keeping nature of god and appeals to his nature that's a statement but basically he recognizes the covenant keeping nature of god Now look at his prayer. Then I said, "Lord God of heaven." That is the way a Jew would address God, "Lord Yahweh." You are the God of heaven. Four times he uses this word in the book of Nehemiah, recognizing that God is ultimately the sovereign, not only creator, owner, but governor of all things that happen in human history, irrespective of where Israel is at that time. God, you are the God of heaven. And second thing he says is, "God, you are a great and awesome God." great and awesome god speaking about the nature of god the power of god but then this is where nehemiah catches hold of god's feet he knows that god is the only god he is not just the tribal god of israel like other people claim territorial gods based on the uh, on the uh, uh, in the places they lived nehemiah knew that god was the god the only god the god of all creation and he knew that this god is unparalleled to anything in universe but where does nehemiah cling to god when he goes to god in prayer it is here he says you are the god <coughs> you keep your covenant of love with those who love him and keep his commandments he recognizes that the special nature that of relationship that this god the only god the sovereign god has with nehemiah and nehemiah's people is that god made a covenant and god keeps that covenant 
he is going way back into the covenant that god made with abraham and with all those people who had the faith of abraham and he says god the reason i come to you is because that you are who you are brothers and sisters i want to challenge you your prayer life will be revitalized if you begin to recognize that the reason god answers prayers is not because the brokenness of your condition not because the the the, the depth of your prayer but because you recognize who god is and that is that he's a covenant keeping god and if there are believers here my brother and sister god wants you to come to him not because you have a great need not because your need is irreparable not even because you have a burden for the needs that of god's people but he wants you to come based on one main foundational truth and that is he has accepted you based on the blood of his son the lord jesus christ he made a covenant and he will keep that covenant God made this covenant right with his people and God made a covenant they failed but God is a covenant keeping God by the way the words here the lord god of heaven who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keep his commandments are not like god keeps his covenant only when people keep their people are obedient this is a reference to god's covenant made with god's people and god's law given to god's people and recognizing that these are truly god's people who live by his commandments this is not to say god only keeps his covenant when people obey him this is to recognize the special nature of relationship israel had with god who came under his covenant keeping relationship he recognizes that god is a covenant keeping god and now he appeals to god's nature he says lord please be let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to the prayer of your servant who is praying before you day and night for your servants the people of israel you know it is important that we we recognize the words nehemiah is using these are some of the words that are used in the book of psalms we know that god doesn't have ears we know that god doesn't have eyes but these are given so that in our limited understanding god can communicate to us how he truly hears our prayers these prayers that you pray based on your faith that has come because you are saved by grace when you come to the presence of god god says i truly hear your prayer i truly see you and your brokenness or i truly see the condition of my people and when people come to me based on what i am i do listen So first thing is he recognizes the covenant keeping nature of God. So dear brother and sister, the reason you go to God is not because of anything else. The reason God accepts you is not because of anything else but because he is a covenant keeping God and he is a covenant keeping God. Second thing, he realizes the condition of Israel and begins to confess their root problem which is sin. Look at verse 6 and 7. This is the essence of his prayer. He says, "Lord, this is who you are." and this is who we are i confess verse six, i confess the sins we israelites including myself and my father's family have committed against you we have acted very wickedly toward you we have not obeyed the commands decrees and laws you gave your servant moses you know a lot has happened in their history by that time and what nehemiah says is this lord if there is one single problem i can point to and say that this is the reason why we are here it is because we have sinned it is because of sin your brothers and sisters you see brokenness in your marriage in your family in your church in in in, in the in the neighborhood in the corporate world wherever you go understand it is sin that brings brokenness and a person and a person who diagnoses the problem because he sees the world from the eyes of god through the word of god he prays differently he prays according to the real need from god's point of view he says lord our problem is our sin sin is what brought us here it is not because the enemy was powerful it is not because we have failed to defend ourselves as a nation it is not because we have weakened ourselves in some sort of you know military strength or whatever lord we are here because 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 and only because sin and we are those sinners i confess the sins we israelites including myself and my father's family have committed against you and here is where you see the mark of a godly person not just a godly leader but a godly person 
you know nehemiah is living basically 100 years after the episode of how god brought judgment on his people but nehemiah identifies himself with the sin there's two way application i believe for this you know as god's people we live in different units we live in church we live in family we live as as brother and sister but understand every time a person sins at some level it affects every part of the community and a person who only wants to look at the sin of people will begin to condemn but a person who looks at his heart says lord this is who we are and he identifies or she identifies himself with the part of sin though nehemiah may not have actively been part of that sin of you know the people of israel at that time but nehemiah says lord i confess the sins we israelites including myself and my father's family have committed against you what is the sin can you tell me can you identify the sins that are mentioned there anything that you see anything yeah let yeah let's let's begin with where he begins listen that is the sin part we have acted very wickedly or corruptly toward you what is nehemiah saying listen lord we have not just merely broken some propositions of truths that you put before us which is your law we have basically dealt with you in a very wicked way we have dealt with you in a very very wicked way what is wickedness in in some way or the other giving the person what he never deserves and treating the person with absolute absolute you know uh, uh, ungratefulness see the reason israel was in the state is not because an unrighteous god has been unrighteous with the righteous people the reason israel is here is not because a unholy god has dealt unholyly with a bunch of holy people it's exactly the opposite that an unholy unrighteous wicked people have dealt wickedly towards a holy god nehemiah says lord we come this is both personal and national problem we come before you o oh god Now, brothers and sisters you know as people who are well fed in this church we can always say well we are just part of this community we are growing we are happy and maybe we can just look into a little bit of here what is happening inside the lives of our church members and just be happy but there is so much that is going on outside there who are part of the universal body of the lord jesus christ i'm not saying suddenly you can kind of a uh, a uh, a uh, psych up some sort of burden for them but i believe as you and i begin to go to god every day on our knees he begins to shape our heart to have a burden for some section of uh, have a burden for some group have a burden for some part of god's building process in his universal body while we still carry a part of burden for our own local church and nehemiah says lord lord i confess the sins we israelites including myself and my father's family have committed against you here are people in shame in israel here is the monarch who is ruling the entire world of that time and here is one man secretly praying and see how god is going to move history to accomplish his purposes one man all because he recognizes that the basic problem at the root with god's people is they have sinned by acting wickedly towards a loving gracious merciful holy all powerful infinite god they have clenched their iron fist against the almighty and said we challenge you as god and nehemiah says lord we are sinners lord i have sinned my fathers have sinned our community has sinned lord but you are a covenant keeping god that is the basis why we come back to you lord the third part third part he says quickly you know we cannot act wickedly toward god without first disobeying the commands decrees and laws god gave their people you see a believer sins differently from an unbeliever in the sense that an unbeliever only has conscience to live by but a believer has the commandments of god to live by and therefore when we sin in a way we grieve god probably in a more bitter way and that is why it is to believers we are told in the scriptures that we should not grieve the spirit of god and third thing nehemiah quickly prays about third thing is that he remembers the word of god and pleads for god's mercy remember the word of god 
Look at verse 8 and 9. Remember the instruction you gave your servant Moses saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands, then even if your exiled people are at the farthest horizon, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. See, Nehemiah must have learned the scripture much before a need for prayer came. And therefore, when a need for prayer came, Nehemiah could bank on God's word, not to remind God, God, but to plead with God to now activate his word in order to accomplish his purposes and advance his kingdom. And that is why I say a man or a woman who truly knows God is up through the word of God is a man or a woman who prays because all the knowledge we have about God cannot accomplish an iota of God's purposes. We must go back to God on our knees. God may use you or may not use you, but God will shape you to pray the kind of prayers to advance his kingdom purposes. And what does Nehemiah say? Lord, remember. And this is the instruction God gave. The reason I come back to you is because of who you are. The reason I make this confession is because you commanded that when we sin, if we repent. And Nehemiah has done that. Lord, you said you would give us your mercy. So he says, remember your word, O Lord. And I plead for your mercy, O Lord. We have been unfaithful. You scattered us. Now, as I make this confession, O Lord, this is one of the most moving prayers of confession in uh, the Old Testament, along with the prayer of Ezra and Daniel. He says, Lord, now we confess. Please restore back your work amidst your people. And then what he says, my time is up quickly. Let me go to the last one, fourth one. Not only does Nehemiah remember the word of God, remembers the word of God and asks God for mercy, finally he makes a request saying, Lord, he requests God's mercy and asks for success. He says in verse 10 and 11, Lord, they are your servants. By the way, observe the word servants five times used and the word you or your referring to God ten times used. He says, they are your servants and your people whom you redeemed by your great strength and your mighty hand. Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of this your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight in revering your name. Give your servant success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man. I was cupbearer to the king. Listen to this. A man who began with inquiring about a question because his heart was shaped in daily in the presence of God, probably through prayer and other things. When he went to God with the burden that God has given him for almost four months in several ways he would have prayed. Finally, he says, Lord, make me the answer to this prayer. Not just give me an answer to the prayer, but make me, here I am, available. Now, O Lord, your servants are calling upon you. That is what our identity is. You are the covenant-keeping God. You redeemed us, merciful, forgiving God. You, uh, you said you will restore us. Now we confess our sins. Now, O Lord, as I face this man who is seated on the throne, who once upon a time gave the letters to stop the work, I am going to face him. Lord, give me mercy. Why do you think Nehemiah wanted to go and do this work. Look at the answer, I believe, is in verse 11. Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of this your servant and to the prayer of your servants. What does he say? Who delight in, can we read that? Are you there? In revering your name. All that Nehemiah prayed, all the burden that Nehemiah had, and all that Nehemiah wanted to do was because of one burning passion. He delighted to fear God's name. Brothers and sisters, you take care of delighting in fearing God's name. He will take care of shaping your heart to place sufficient burden to accomplish his purposes. It is not, it is not the height of our profession that is going to determine our influence. It is the depth of vision that we have for God as he shapes our heart for his purposes. Quick applications. Quick applications. Nehemiah means comforted by God. In New Testament terms, we can say saved by the grace of God. It is the man who or the woman who is comforted by God who uniquely has a burden for the work of God. What we see is this, brothers and sisters. The most wasted life, I believe, is a life that has no burden for God and his work. 
not just saved people yes because unsaved people haven't even begun their life but a person who is born again who is saved who knows god but has no burden whatsoever for god and his purposes is a man or a woman who's wasting away his life man listen this is the only time we can obey god to advance his purposes once we are perfected in glory we will not need to obey in a way in the sense that there's nothing called sin there that resists our obedience to god if there is anything called sacrifice anything called burden anything called service unto god in the in the sense of advancing his kingdom work only here afterwards there's nothing it is a wasted life when you and i have no burden for god and do not psych up some burden go to god in prayer he will burden your heart and nehemiah couldn't see the entire thing that was there but what he saw he responded to he went to god said lord here i am please help me and as he began to confess god shaped his heart and dear brothers and sisters there are some new people here probably there are some old people too I want you to know this that there is a god who keeps his covenant and in the old testament he promised that he would send his savior he did send his savior he did send his son he kept his covenant when his son hung on the cross to redeem you and to redeem me and if you are here you already heard while the breaking of the bread happened if you are here there is no other person in entire human history who claimed a status to divine or prophetic status who is like jesus christ born lived died resurrected like him in order to save you and me maybe god brought you here today so that you can hear the gospel so that you may be part of his kingdom and advance his purposes this is an invitation for you shall we pray Oh God, we thank you that you are a covenant keeping God. Amen. The reason we can come to you is not because we are spiritual godly obedient or we have some merit, but your son on the cross is our confidence. His blood for us is our confidence. We come to you, oh Lord, confessing our own sin of failing to see the brokenness all around us inside the church and outside. And we ask you to forgive us, oh Lord. individually and together as a corporate body and we pray dear lord that you would cause us to delight in fearing your name that we would become oh lord your agents your people who carry your burden for your glory in this world help us oh lord to begin to do that by bending our knees in your presence daily until you shape our heart consume our heart with a blaze for your glory thank you oh lord in jesus name we offer this prayer amen